All right, so we'll move on to our next presentation from Chris. Chris Kuzin is the founder of Kuzin Analytics. He's been uh, building analytic models using the Excel solver since 2007. Uh, he's found an interesting way to help op businesses optimize their complex talent problems. Today, he's using analytic solver data mining and analytic solver simulation to help forecast the ROI of personnel and selection decisions. Uh, and using analytic solver optimization for NPV budgeting and staffing problems. Uh, he's going to be presenting how he's doing all of this today and sh walking us through some of uh, the interesting things he's learned while uh, while presenting this stuff to his clients and showing them. He's been working with cl uh, clients all around the world, and uh, I think he's got some very interesting stuff to show us today. Uh, Chris, with that said, can I hand it off to you? Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much, Bob, and thanks, uh, Dr. Seema and Cindy Edgar also for making this possible. Well, the topic is a vast one, and a half hour won't do it justice, but I do have a 14-page white paper. If you go to my company's website, kunzianalytics.com, in the About Us section, you can download that white paper and find out more about the topic. The, uh, today, Today's agenda is to talk about just two different subjects. Uh, one has to do with fit and the other one with adaptation. And each one of these topics demands a different part of the analytic solver uh, software. So we'll be talking about different functions that are used and helpful in talent optimization. And if I could use a sporting or a boxing analogy for me, this is like the left and the right jab, right? When you combine both of these types of optimization um, using artificial intelligence, you're really going to uh, provide a lot of value to your employees that are working for you and your company. The, the topic, uh, kind of the, um, the canvas that we're using, the data that we're optimizing, comes from the uh, assessment industry. And over 90% of Fortune 1000 companies are using some form of, of a, an assessment to make personnel decisions. These are instruments typically taken online, and they measure cognitive, behavioral traits, occupational interests, hard and soft skills. The um, next topic that deals with fit, it has to do with job matching. And over the last oh, 20, 30 years, publishing companies have devised different systems, uh, point deduction systems, to score assessment data and give to their clients, and these are typically recruiters, their hiring managers, people in human resources, um, some type of an indication of, of whether someone has a good fit with a job. And these point systems are unique to the publishing company. They're typically proprietary. So here's an example of uh, my one of my preferred publishing companies. It's down in Texas, a very simple assessment that takes only about a half hour online. And in the upper right-hand corner, you see that job match score. It's a percent. This individual who was scored against a success pattern or performance model scored 76%. And here we're only dealing with seven different dimensions. The uh, first dimension is cognitive thinking. And you can see that the person scored uh, a six in the optimal range which is six, seven, and eight. So no points were deducted. And theoretically, if a candidate, a job applicant, scored within the optimal range for all of the dimensions, they'd get a 100% score. Now, you can see that for a number of the personality traits, for manageability, competitiveness, people contact, sense of urgency, and take charge, we've got gaps. This candidate scored outside of the optimal range above and below. So that, that's the reason for the uh, point deduction and, and not getting a 100% match. You can see from this report that the largest gap is in that uh, bottom 
competency, or excuse me, the bottom behavioral trait, take charge, which has to do with someone's innate need to, to lead in a situation more than follow. And this is on a standard nine unit scale. So most of the population would score a four, five, or six, just as the competitiveness benchmark asks. 54% of the population, most people would score a four, five, and six. And the tails, a one, two, and three, such as people contact and attitude, demanding lower scores, that's the bottom 23%. And uh, reasoning ability goes up to an eight. So, you know, every model is going to be custom for the client. And then we have the obligation of, of providing accurate, valuable, valid performance models and success patterns to our clients. This screen shows kind of like the, the smallest problem we're solving and uh, one of the largest ones that I've, I've had to solve with uh, in, you know, a longer instrument. So that 32 to the 14th power is the number of possible permutations, the number of different models that could be created for an instrument that measures 14 different dimensions on a standard 10 unit scale with a certain uh, width of benchmark. And that report that we just saw with the reasoning ability, the manageability, and people contact, so forth, that's a problem that's 18 to the seventh power, a little over 612 million possible permutations. Now, for many years, I built models using publisher software and you know, try to eyeball and, and tweak, and sometimes it would take me a half of a day, and I'd have 10 different iterations of a model to try to get it to be as accurate as possible with much greater accuracy. And so using the optimization section of the software, um, I, I really then uh, revolutionized my whole business because I was now uh, using the power of, of computation. And since our problems are uh, nonlinear and non-smooth, I found that the best engine, uh, the most accurate one that gets the job done the quickest was a evolutionary engine. So that means that the algorithm would learn as it go through different nodes and it would uh, show me my results and it would tick up and I could see it, it functioning and, and achieving better and better results until it would time out and stop. Now, why is this all important to optimize talent? And I'll tell you that um, there's some marvelous research that was done, published about five years ago by five different professors at different universities. Frank Bosco is a uh, just a, a, a well-known professor in the psychometric world. One of his books is the standard text for anyone that's uh, using assessments. Herman Aguinness, I spoke with him a couple years ago on the phone, and he was very helpful to me. He was at uh, the Kelly School of Business in Indiana University. Now he's at George Washington University. These are all well-published professors at recognized institutions. and. They did a, a study of 30 years of published research in the psychometric industry, published in Applied Psychology and Personnel Psychology from 1980 to 2010. And they looked at the correlation coefficients. So again, validity. And they call it here an effect size. That's just a synonym for a validity coefficient, a correlation coefficient, Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. And you can see that with the solver, we got a correlation with that point system that is 0.49. Well, our assessment measures a cognitive ability, so the correlation between performance, knowledge, skills, and abilities at the 80th percentile is 0.4. And then we're measuring six behavioral traits, which are psychological characteristics. And so uh, that typically has lower correlations, but we've got this, you know, wonderful overall correlation um, way above 0.31.
So you can tell that we're getting unusually high um, results that knock on the door of the ceiling of validity. And validity in the assessments is limited by the reliability of the instrument. And there's a reliability coefficient that's squared and it gives us the ceiling or the, the highest possible validity. We're achieving those limits with the solver. Now, um, I've, I've gone back to models that I've built without the solver and then with the solver and I'm getting um, an increase in value of 25 to 60%. So that for um, some models, high important uh, critical models, we're talking about millions of dollars of additional value. So um, this increase in accuracy of 25 to 60% is huge. And uh, we can quantify that. Now, um, I'd like to now move on to the second topic because it's not only about using the machine learning in the optimization software, building uh, better models for the testing industry and the assessment industry. Once you've hired that individual or group of individuals because they're more, more likely to perform well in the job statistically, now you want to coach them so that they adapt their uh, unique uh, natural and acquired behaviors and traits to do the job really well. And so this now, we're not going to use the optimization software. Now we jump to the data mining uh, software in uh, the, um, the solver. So this is really exciting. And this is a snapshot of a real data set. Um, now, you know we measure different constructs. Not all of them are going to be a critical success factors, statistically significant features or variables to predict a certain key performance indicator. And here's a performance indicator, which is uh, average annual sales for a sales team. And it was binned. So if my recollection is correct, we had seven different levels. And now we have the results on an assessment for one salesperson who's been hired. Now this salesperson's original results on manageability, which is measuring the innate tendency to follow policies and procedures, uh, work according to the rules, this person scored a uh, five which is right in the middle of the distribution. Like most people in the population, 20% of the population would score a five. And we know because it, this is an interactive spreadsheet thanks to, thanks to our solver software. And as soon as that coach, that sales rep, the uh, sales manager um, is able to just type in a four instead of a five, then the spreadsheet updates automatically and this candidate was at the second level was only uh, selling uh, well was selling $143,000 below this by have by being a five in manageability and a two unit increase right so the uh, decisiveness, how quickly this salesperson was able to make decisions, this person was a five in decisiveness. So through coaching and conscious effort and willpower on his or her own part, by modifying behavior in certain sales situations, modifying that behavior by increasing decisiveness by what would be two units on this standard nine unit scale, we can achieve uh, a forecast increase in annual sales for this person by over $350,000 per year. Now what's nice about this is we're using a, data, a predictive data mining algorithm and uh, the sample is 30. These are 30 uh, high-level salespeople and because our, our model is a regression tree and um, well, we're getting a very high R squared statistic, 0.99 for this incumbent group. And the, the uh, 
plus or minus the root mean square error is just just over thirty four hundred dollars. So that's a really a very nice accurate um, accurate statistical model that we're using for coaching to help the sales manager coach this new incumbent. Um, we're using the ensemble uh, sampling because in our industry, when you apply these algorithms to talent, we're not dealing with hundreds of people in the same role. If we do, and sometimes I have had that luxury, well, then you've got good sample sizes and you've got good statistical power because of the size of the sample. But here, we're going to use the boosting algorithm, which uh, basically crowdsources instead of matching the observations against a single model, we're matching against 10. And the algorithm is uh, at a boost is solving the uh, most difficult uh, observations first to categorize them into the right bin. And then uh, we're, it's, it's voting and we're coming up with a hyper accurate model. So that's just a marvelous thing that we've got not only all of these predictive algorithms, but we also have in the software, the ensemble, uh, different methods for sampling to overcome small samples. Now, um, a, a word about, this is a training set, right? So it's, we, when we do have larger samples, we can then split into a validation set also, a certain percentage, uh, 30, 40% of the set will then not, will have a training set and a validation set. And if we had the luxury of then having a testing set, that would be marvelous. But that's not always real world application. So we do the best we can with our training data set and the partitioning of the data. And then going back to the test publisher, all these test publishers have some type of a report that will help a consultant coach uh, an individual who's been hired, manage, coach, and so forth. But now we know which of the variables measured by the publishing company are statistically significant. We've done our machine learning, the optimization to get them hired. The data mining algorithms now tells us which of those features are, are predictive of our metrics of interest. Now we can go back to the test publisher's reports and bring much more meaning to our clients. And so at Quincy Analytics, we're leveraging artificial intelligence in a unique way. We're, we're dealing with very large clients. Thank you so much for that great presentation, Chris. It's really interesting what you're doing there. Thank you. And I'd, I'd also like to say that we're starting to measure new constructs such as emotional intelligence, I'm working with a company in Australia that has seven different competencies. And so... Um, it's not just about IQ, it's also about EQ, which is, you know, the emotional uh, intelligence coefficient. But I also think, and there's, there's research about the adaptability, how adaptable people are to be able to um, behave differently through one-on-one -on -one coaching. And that's, um, that's the responsibility of nearly every manager to try to find the, the right role for their direct reports in the company and then to coach them so that they're successful and using their, their natural and acquired um, talents. Everyone's unique, so we want to respect that. Um, artificial intelligence is a supplement. It does not replace human um, cognition and all of the uh, insights that we have uh, in in uh, working and, and dealing with people, those around us in our atmosphere. This is a supplemental type of instrument, and I don't think people should be afraid of artificial intelligence. It's a misnomer. It should be called artificial reasoning because intelligence is really intuition, and a machine will never be able to intuit. It might be able to mimic, but it's really reasoning, which is a lower function than the higher level of intuition which just knows things and understands things, whether it can be explained or not. It's a very good explanation of, of the difference there. Um, and I don't see any questions yet.
So uh, I just wanted to thank both our presenters today. Uh, Seema and Chris, thank you so much for taking time today to help answer questions. And uh, you know, anyone, Chris's information is still here on the bottom of the screen. With all that said, uh, I think we're gonna conclude the webinar for the day. I hope everyone has a great rest of their week.